them up because I used to wear a tuxedo with the white gloves, top hat, and the whole bit. And the one time I drove up and got in front of Olive Garden, got out, walked around, opened the door for them. They all went in. I got back in the car and I drove and I waited until they were about ready. I drove right up in front of the thing and I stood there at the door with my hands behind my back waiting for them to come out. And all these people are looking at me like, what is going on? Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of the Talking About Cars podcast. As Randy Cardoon, that be me, goes on the road this time to another interesting spot where there are some really cool classic cars to be seen, and we can get the story of those cars, because everybody has a car story. This time, you know, I'm into station wagons, which is kind of like a little obvious at this point, and is it, that, of course, being my 1957 Pontiac Custom Safari Wagon. Kind of looks like a Nomad, but it's not. Ask any Nomad owner Ask any Pontiac owner. They know it's not the same. All right. So some time back, we visited the Avance Wagon Fest in Tacoma, Washington, uh, just outside the LeMay America's Car Museum there on their lawn. It was kind of a fun event. A lot of cars showed up. Interestingly enough, not as many classics as there were recent station wagons, and even those cars had a story. So let's catch up with some interesting wagons, including one that has a concept you're very familiar with. Although, to be honest, it's nothing like you've ever seen before. I am a very big Ghostbusters fan, Gen X. Uh, I grew up with Ghostbusters, and I still like them today. And I actually was here for the coming of Gozer in 1984, so I remember that. Here for the coming of Gozer. I was. I survived the coming of Gozer in 1984 with the original Ghostbusters. So, oh. yeah, yeah. You said here. I thought it had something to do with Seattle or Tacoma. On, on the on the planet, on the planet. A lot of people don't realize what Ghostbusters is anymore, and they'll be pulling up next to me at stoplight, and they're going, "Are you some kind of weather researcher?" I'm like, "Yes, some kind of weather researcher. That's that's it." But with the new movies that have come out in the recent years, I think there's a whole new generation of kids that are experiencing Ghostbusters and the fun that it was about. And, uh, you know, it's been interesting driving the car. Tell me a little bit about, well, as long as you brought it up, the new movies. What do you think of the new movies? Um, the latest movie, The Frozen Empire, it was okay. I don't think it's the best. The last one that they did with the grandchildren, I think that was top notch. They did an excellent job on that and they had Easter eggs for all of the old school Ghostbusters to really enjoy, but I still enjoy the first two. That's what I've uh, sort of patterned my homage after. And uh, you know, it was interesting. I used to do charity car shows with a local Subaru group and uh, we came up with the idea of doing a charity uh, Halloween costume contest where you would actually dress up your cars and you would dress up and you know we would donate money to Hope Link or some other kind of worthy cause and do a food drive and have a lot of fun for the evening as well and uh, uh, the first year that I dressed the car up I had skeletons all over it and it was a bone wagon driving down the road four or five skeletons all over the top of the car hanging on for dear life and uh, it got some looks, but I had some folks at the car show say, you know what you ought to do? You ought to turn this into an ectomobile, an ecto wagon. And I said, hmm, it's an idea. I can figure this out. I'm an engineer. I might be able to come up with some interesting things. And this was about 10 years ago. And uh, every year that I do this, and sometimes I'll take a year off, uh, I'll add a little bit more. I'll do something a little bit different. Uh, but the key is, making it roadworthy so i'm not losing things on the highway uh because the looks that people get when you pass them in uh an ecto wagon are absolutely priceless and that usually takes my mind off of the state of the world but the other point of doing this is if i can help someone else stop thinking about the craziness and the negative stuff for even five minutes out of their day even if it's just from a sheer state of confusion I'll do it. That's me sort of giving back a little bit and trying to diffuse things a little bit. So, and you say, you know, it's political season, so 
Peter Venkman, 2024, fully support him. You know, if you're tired of being slime, vote Venkman. <laughs> but that, that's a little bit of a background of what I do on this, and it does take a fair amount of work. Uh, I would say 90% of it is homemade or put together with spare parts, so it's reduce, re reuse, recycle. And you told me beforehand that this actually all comes off uh, as far as this particular Subaru is concerned? Yes, this all comes off. It, it only uh, comes on like after Labor Day. It uh, ramps up the season right around Halloween quite a bit. And then um, I will usually keep it on until the first couple of weeks in November. Uh, a couple of years I've continued it on um, through Christmas and through New Year's. But I've changed things up a little bit. I would change the decals out and make Grinch Busters and uh, put on a Santa Claus hat and a beard and drive around like that and shake my finger at all the naughty boys and girls. And, uh, you know, once again, it's simply because it's a lot of work and if I can leave it up a little bit longer, I will do that. But um, I will say with all of this on here, it's like having a wind sail on a normally pretty aerodynamic wagon. Um, miles per gallon goes down, smiles per gallon goes up. But at some point, because it is still a daily driver with 345,000 miles on it and still counting, I got to take this stuff off. I just can't afford the gas on it. So, and it's also not the easiest thing to store with everything on there. So, the so how, t how, and why did you decide on a Subaru as far as the car? As opposed, I am assuming it has something to do with the fact that it's hard to get a '60s Cadillac uh, hearse to uh, get the real deal. Getting a 59 Miller Meteor and having a place to store it, if I could, I would. I can't, don't have anywhere to keep it, so not doing that now. Um, I was sort of a Subaru fan before this, which is why I was part of the Subaru Car Club that was here locally in West Washington. And uh, had a couple of different Subarus. I'm a Subaru brand ambassador, so I, I still promote the brand, but I believe in the brand for the Pacific Northwest because we get all sorts of crazy weather and having that full-time uh, all-wheel drive, symmetrical all-wheel drive really makes a difference. Uh, I can go just about anywhere, whether you're going out in the woods, you're going on the streets, you're going back and forth to work, you're going to get groceries in your wagon. Um, Subaru just has a, has a good brand and good quality for that, and I still believe in them. And we've got uh, three older Subarus in the household. And uh, I figured, well, you know, I don't have the Miller Meteor Cadillac, so I'll work with what I have. This is what I had, and this is what I chose. How long did it take to put together? I mean, obviously, since it comes apart, I assume not too long. It takes uh, between dealing with the decals and the superstructure and all of the other smaller detailed parts, it takes the better part of two days to get it up into this condition. And even today, you know, I had not yet tested all of my flashing lights yet. I had the electrical system set up. I knew how it was supposed to work, but there's always a little tweaking. Same thing with the sound system. It takes a little bit of tweaking and, you know, inevitably something always breaks when it goes into storage every year. So I've got to do the gluing and, you know, putting things back together with zip ties, you know, finding a new part, etc. So The reaction I assume you get from this is pretty positive. I, it's pretty positive. As I said, I have a, a certain number of people that are unfamiliar with the films that think I'm uh, either one, some kind of weather researcher, two, some kind of real paranormal exterminator, or, you know, the best ones are the folks that really do remember the movies like I did, and they're going, oh, that's awesome, that's great. And they don't care that it's not a Miller Meteor wagon, you know. And, and then seeing the younger generation now after they've been dealing with the movies, the recent movies, they're like, Mom, Dad, look, Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters. So and Mom and Dad are like, what? <laughs> So I, I think that's good too. You know, I think there will be some kids that see this today and they probably go home talking about it and maybe say, I want to be a Ghostbuster for Halloween. So I'd love to see more little Ghostbusters out there for Halloween. And I do, I do more than just a car. I actually have the full suit. I've got a pack that I built. I have all different kinds of things that I've done that, so when it gets closer to Halloween and they have different zombie walks or parades, I'll dress up completely for that. So. All right, very cool. What's your favorite part about this uh, Ecto? You know, it's probably got to be Slimer. 
you know, I, I, it's funny. I can be driving on the highway on there, and people are already a little bit in awe when they're pulling up next to me, and I'll just slowly roll down that back window, and they see Slimer, and you just see them bust out laughing. So I, I think that's still still my favorite part, and that sort of embodies the whole movie and the fun that's behind it is, you know, yeah, scary stuff is sort of fun too. And uh, if I can make some people smile a little bit, like Slimer smiling, I'm happy to do that. It would be nice to one day if uh, Bill or Dan or anybody comes through Seattle, they should probably uh, autograph your car. Uh, that'd be real nice, yeah. No, I, I have a great respect for them as actors, even today, as you know, they're sort of winding down their careers in many cases. But yeah, no, I've been a bi big, big follower of that whole group. Okay, so this is a 1991 Saab 9000 Turbo, and then the camper on top is called a Topola. Um, I've lovingly nicknamed it the Turbo Topper. Um, in Sweden, they made about, I think, 200 of the Topolas across a few different Saab models. For the Model 9000, they only made four of them that are known. So basically, I've been a Saab enthusiast my entire life. And I saw a Topola when I was 12 years old and fell in love with the idea. The Saab 9000 has always been my favorite car. And it took me about 20 years to locate a 9,000 Topola and be able to buy it and ship it to the States. So I bought it a couple years ago and it was on a 9,000 non-turbo that had some rust issues. So I imported it on that car and picked up this turbocharged 91 9,000 that was in really rough shape, stripped it down, redid the interior, redid the exterior, and here we are. Wow. Yeah. So what did you do with the other one? Just throw it away, basically? Because you only bought it for the top. Yeah, so I actually ended up using it as a parts car. It had some rust issues just from coming from Sweden, but the interior was actually like preserved really well, and it provided a lot of parts I needed for this car. Um, this car had actually been flooded in a flash flood from a river, and then it had been sitting under a tree, and I mean, the paint was ruined, so... This particular car was actually a survivor of a flood. Yeah, about five months ago, this car could have easily gone to the junkyard. Yeah, so did a full cut and buff on the paint myself, restored that, and then had this special European body kit for the car painted and stripped the interior out, used like the carpets from the parts car, installed newer Saab seats into it, and just completely went through it. Are you from Sweden or, or the Netherlands? Because to know, to know this much, especially about the topper, how did you find out about it to begin with? Yeah, so my parents have been into Saabs my entire life, and that's how I ended up seeing one when I was 12. I've been to Sweden multiple times with my family. My mom used to sell new Saabs, so I kind of come by it naturally. And like I said, the 9000's always been my favorite Saab, even though, you know, with, as far as Saab enthusiasts go, it wasn't always the most popular. It wasn't the sportiest car. The 900 was typically the one that Saab owners really loved. Two-door hatchback. Saab was a larger fam. The 9000 was a larger family car. But for whatever reason, I've always loved it. Um, when I was 19, 20, I, I built a 9000 to about 500 horsepower, and so this building this car just came naturally to me. I, you know. I feel like I'm burying the lead. So how long have you been into cars to the point where you know how to work on them? So my dad always worked on cars when I was little, but I didn't ever really learn from him. I would go out to give him a hand when he needed a hand. But when I was 17, I bought a 9000 with a manual transmission, quickly burned the clutch out, and didn't have the money to pay someone to do it. So I had to pull the transmission and do the clutch myself, and that was, that was the, the learning point for me where I was like, oh, I can do this. You say that like it's like, uh, I'm going to make myself a sandwich. I mean, obviously it's not that easy. Obviously you have some skills going into it. Yeah, so... Um, I think that I'm just very mechanically inclined naturally and then, you know, seeing my dad work on cars and then having access to his shop too. You know, he would clear out a bay so that I could use it to work on it. So I had access to all the right tools. And I never worked on a car before when I when I pulled that transmission out and did the clutch, but my brother sat in there and read the repair manual to me and I did what he said. How hard was it to find this top? You said you found it in Sweden. I mean, that 
What about what year did you do that? Because I mean, I assume they had internet back then. Yeah, so I actually just bought this two years ago. I have a good friend over in Sweden that has a Topola on his Saab 93, and he's really active in the community there. And as soon as this one came up for auction, he told me, and he played a huge role in helping me buy it, store it in Sweden until I was able to ship it here. Very good. Yeah. Now you were saying you had trouble trying to find a car like this to be able to fit the Topola. Yeah, so initially I was planning on using the car it was coming on, but I didn't realize the extent of the, the rust on the body. So I did a nationwide search for another car to use, and I actually couldn't find one. And my, I, I had to road trip the topper on the non-turbo car home from the Port of Baltimore. And my last stop on my way home, I stopped to see a Saab friend in Walla Walla. And we were looking at the car and he said, oh, he said, do you want a 91 9000 Turbo? I know where there's one just just sitting. And I was like, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> so I went back a few weeks later and bled the clutch and was able to drive this car home. And here we are. You um, I want to go back. You picked up the, the other car with the top on it in Baltimore. Did you tell me you, maybe I misunderstood, did you drive that back here? Yeah, so when I shipped the car from Sweden, I shared the container with another Saab enthusiast, and the container landed at the Port of Baltimore. So I picked the car up right out of the container, drove three miles on dry rotted tires, brought all the tools with me I could need to do emergency repairs on the way home, and, you know, drove a few hours to the north, had the oil changed at a Saab shop, and and then made my way back to Washington. Wow. How, long, how long did that take and how many days? I think I made it about a five or six day trip. Did some camping obviously on the way back. Went to Moab, went, went kind of off road to do some camping in Moab, got a flat tire, but what's, made it home. What's the best thing about this car? Um, it doesn't feel like you're driving with essentially an entire RV on the back it has the power to haul it around it's it's very very comfortable and fun to drive and you have a full camper to use wherever you want to go so you can just take the family or you or whomever and just take go on a trip and not have to worry about hotels yeah and the top of is made to come on and off the cars really easily as you can see it just sits on the roof rack here and then it actually you just take the hatch off and it drops right in so you can actually put the hatch back on the car kind of like just putting a camper in the bed of a truck. Um, so you have the versatility of having it on there or or off. What are people's reaction to this? People love it. You know, everywhere I go as I'm driving, everyone's giving the thumbs up and taking pictures as we drive past. And, you know, it just makes people happy. They've never seen anything like this before. All right, so here we have a 1988 Subaru GL10. So it's a factory turbo car, factory five-speed car. I bought the car back in 2004. I drove it from Olympia to my house and immediately ripped the engine transmission out of it. It started its, its second life with a Japanese uh, two liter out of a WRX uh, with the five-speed transmission. I drove it that way for a while and then I went to a 2.5 liter, uh, an EJ257 motor. I drove it that way for a while, then put the STI six speed in it, drove it that way for a while. I ended up driving the car for about 15 years as a daily driver at just north of 300 horsepower. A lot of fun, um, had the Brembo brakes, the whole nine yards, the STI drivetrain. Um, and then I had kids. I've got three kids at home now and a wife. And so the five of us didn't fit real well in this car anymore. Um, you took all the seats out. Now it basically, uh, how long did it take you to rip all the seats out and do that? So this car, from the time I drove it into my garage till I drove it out under its own power was only about five or six months. Um, of course, that was during COVID, and so I had a lot of time in the garage, a lot of late nights. Um, and yeah, so all the interior got ripped out. Everything from the front seats to the back bumper inside the car got cut out, new frame welded in, and sheet metal, uh, resheet metaled, and uh, put back together. Uh, do we assume that this was a COVID project, or did you plan on doing something like this before all that happened? You know, it was in the makings for some time before that. I kept going out to the drag strip and I kept breaking axles. And I said, you know what, if I had a four nine inch, I wouldn't break axles. And so it was more of a joke. But then with the larger family, I upgraded to a legacy. And then it's like, what am I going to do with the old GL? And I said, you know what, 
let's cut it apart. If it doesn't work out, I'll send it to the scrapyard. If it does work out, it's going to be a whole lot of fun. And as you can see it here today, it worked out. And you've pretty much, if not done everything on this thing, all of it. Every single thing on this car, bumper to bumper, was done in my garage at home, except for the transmission was built by Strange Auto Barn, um, and uh, Drift Office did the tuning on the ECU. Okay. And where do you race this usually? Uh, typically race it at Pacific Raceways, and occasionally I do go out to Bremerton and run eighth mile as well. Very cool. So it, it basically wasn't necessarily the car you bought to race, but it kind of transitioned into that, sounds like, pretty simply. It did, very much so, yeah. Oh, very good. So what do you do with it now? What more do you have to do to it now? Because, you know, once you start working on these things, you're always tweaking it, right? You know, it's, my theory is once it's done, it's for sale. So <laughs> the part that I really enjoy is the modifying and tweaking. And so the next stop is going to be a uh, higher horsepower motor. So the goal is to, to get into the nines. And so a couple, couple more horsepower, I think, we'll be able to do it. So are you running a Japanese power plant on it, or are you going to start putting in other engines or so right now it's a it's a US 2005 EJ257 block with just manly rods and JE pistons and then I actually am running Japanese non-turbo EJ204 heads because they were 200 bucks and STI heads are a thousand dollars and it is a budget build believe it or not and so it has all STI cams and springs and it and everything in it in the heads but the heads casts themselves are non-turbo castings. I teach automotive classes at Green River College um, and have been for heck, almost 15 years now. We're talking about how now you are uh, working to try and teach them EV automotive basically. Yeah so just this uh, in the last two years we've procured about a million dollars worth of uh, state and federal grants and uh, so by this time next year we'll be teaching some full EV hybrid uh, classes to add on top of our current uh, associate's degree that we have will have a couple of EV uh, certificates that will be top on top I mean, of that. That's, that's huge news considering all the stories we've all heard about auto shop and how they're cutting it out of schools and doing all that other stuff. So how did you get that to happen? It is, you know, so I taught high school automotive for a number of years before I started teaching at the college. And so most of the high schools are cutting back we've been able to keep most of them in at least in this area keep the high school automotive programs going um, but uh, it's an absolute necessity because i mean we've got hundreds of millions of cars out on the road they're all going to break they have to have somebody to fix them and it's you know it's uh it's not a dirty job today it's a very technical and very advanced job that we're working on and that we're teaching students to do today is that hard though in this climate to talk people with the money to come up with that stuff for doing these courses you know, it's not bad um, because most of our students, probably 80% of our students, are not paying 100% of their tuition. They're getting uh, financial aid, they're getting work, uh, workforce credit, they're getting a uh, GI Bill or something through uh, a high school. I've got a number of students that are doing Running Start. So probably 80% of my students are financially, it's not costing them anything or much. So it's not hard, that's, that side of it's not hard to talk them. What does your wife think about you taking all her old cars and uh, turning them into uh, hot rods or EVs? You know, when I married my wife, I was a car guy. She grew up with a father's a car guy, so she understands that I'm gonna be a car guy. When we got married, we had some rules. There's no cars in the driveway on blocks. It has to look nice, so everything I own runs and drives unless it's a current project. Um, but, uh, she understands, and she's a little bit of a car gal herself, so it works out. How does it do as a wagon as far as handling on the racetrack? Um, for me, that doesn't matter because I'm a wagon guy, and so if the wagon doesn't handle as well, it's still going to be a wagon because that's what I drive. Um, but, you know, the way it's, it's really worked out really well. It, uh, the, it's got a four-link rear end with the nine-inch, and uh, from the very first time I launched it, I was going to just do like a quick 60 foot pull just to see what it did. And I did a full quarter mile pull, not wide open, but I did a full pull on the first run because it hooked and it went and it did what it was supposed to do. So I imagine cars like this are a curiosity on the racetrack because obviously you're used to really full blown, you know, two doors, four doors, whatever. But to get a station wagon out here to race. Uh, what's the crowd reaction to this been? You know, most often it's, what is it? Um, that it doesn't really say Subaru all over it. And then the second question is, once I tell them it's a Subaru, is what engine's in it? And they don't believe that it is still the four-cylinder Subaru engine. Um, but yeah, I get 
most people don't know what it is. It's definitely kind of uh, a one-off, kind of a donkey in a thoroughbred out of the racetrack. And, um, and so, but it, it definitely turns some heads when it's running low tens out there with a bunch of big V8 cars that are running, you know, 12s. So does so. that mean next time you get a station wagon, you're gonna pull the one you're using as your daily driver in to try and redo that? Uh, I'll be honest with you, it's uh, not necessarily uh, the most desired, but my next swap is going to be an EV swap on a Legacy. Oh. Oh. <laughs> what see? are you going to use as guts? You're going to use a Tesla or what? No, it'll be Nissan Leaf guts because they're cheap and affordable. Would they work on something that big? Of course they will. Oh, okay. It's got lots of torque, and it doesn't have to be fast. It just has to be different. Yeah, well, that it would be. Uh, we got a 91 Isuzu Gemini. Uh, it's a Bahamas green uh, version of the color. Uh, found it on Yahoo Auction Japan and had it imported. Do you normally peruse uh, Yahoo Auctions Japan and why? I do, because uh, I have two Isuzus now. The uh, reason why is a lot of the parts for the car obviously are there, so I have to purchase them and ship them back, back here to get them. Okay, so what, what got you on to uh, Zuzus from uh, other countries to begin with? Uh, probably back in like 20, uh, 2008, I'll correct that. Uh, a buddy of mine in Colorado Springs, Colorado had a Geostorm. And I don't know what it was, but it was really neat and he turboed it. I'm like, well, those, that's a really interesting vehicle. So I started looking for a Geostorm in the U.S. And I found a GSI in Washington. I was currently living in California and had, had bought it and had my parents drive it to their place. And I flew up, picked it up and drove it home and started working on them and realized how really fun these cars are. And the Geostorm turned out to be an Isuzu Impulse underneath. All right, so looking on the side of this, it looks kind of like a shrunken version of a Chevy Blazer. I mean, and of course this was a GM vehicle anyway. Yeah, it was. I mean, the Geo line was sold by Chevrolet, certainly, but it, no, we're not a General Motors vehicle. It's all a Suzu. Yeah. But yeah, I, I go with the Blazer a little bit. It's not not off road, but no. But it's interesting. The big window in the back on the side there, and, and there are some other things on it. But what it, what is it about this car that you really like? Uh, one was a wagon, and I haven't owned a wagon before. I've owned the two door coupes, you know, the hatchbacks, and I currently have the sedan. Uh, so. We have a, a group of guys that are called the Wagon Back Preservation Society. So I've decided I wanted to join this group and get a wagon. And this is the one I told you I saw on Yahoo Auctions Japan. It was Bahamas Green, which was striking to me. I'd never seen the color in any of our Suzus, and plus it was a wagon. I said, yeah, I'm in. And that's how I acquired it. That's, that's very cool. I. It almost has kind of nomad lines, if you will. I mean, if you want to stretch your imagination. Yeah, I think most of the spectators that have come by the car today have said it's just a refreshing kind of different different look to a traditional Japanese car. So yeah, the Suzu had some good 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 artists, you know, in their in their um, within their community. Uh, oh, how many of these do you have? <laughs> Only two. Only two now. Okay, I thought maybe you said you had me. One, maybe a third one soon. I talked to a gentleman that walked by and owns Impulse. He's, I think he lives in Auburn, so I'm gonna. I got his phone number. We're gonna hook up and we'll figure this out. Oh, okay. So, so that's, what, what's your daily driver? Uh, Volkswagen Eos. Not as not as interesting as this. No. <laughs> Not by any means. What's uh, one of the more fun stories you have about driving this particular car? Yeah, uh, picked it up in Ferndale from the import guys and started it up and I asked if it had, if he checked the antifreeze and just made sure things. He goes, well, I charged the battery. Goes, okay, so it got, got on my way and I noticed the fuel was a little low, so I close by to where I picked it up. I got a little bit of fuel and got on my way. Um, as I got going, I noticed the check engine light starting to come on and off and on and off and so with the power electrically it was giving me something's not right uh, I made it about 30 miles away and I realized the car was gonna die so luckily I don't remember the exact Burlington I think I made it to uh, I pulled in there next to some car dealerships thankfully 
and it was pretty hot that day. And I popped the hood and had a guy come over and test the uh, charging system, and he said the battery's toast and it's not charging. So that was where I stopped, and the wife had already left me with the tools and the Jetta. Of course she did. Of course she did. So I asked, please come back, because I need to get this. I had to get a whole new battery from Napa, and basically I drove it from Burlington all the way back to Yelm on a brand new battery, hoping it wouldn't die again, because the alternator was bad. Did you know anything about its life in Japan? No. Not at all. No. Sometimes you can learn or something. I didn't know if that was even a doable thing. They, they, they give a grading sheet and you can look at it, but it's all in Japanese. I could have probably translated it, but basically it's cosmetic. They don't tell you much about oil or battery. Or... So you have another Japanese uh, Gemini? I do. Oh, you do. What's the story with that? Uh, it's it's Carn. I got that two years ago. Um, I found this on Yahoo Auctions Japan as well. Uh, I basically scouted it for about three months looking at it online, trying to figure out, do I buy it, do I not buy it? And there was a number 50 that was always within the Japanese writing, and I couldn't figure out what it meant. Finally, I had somebody translate it, and they said, oh, yeah, there's only 50 of these cars. So it struck me as like, ah, this is very, very rare. It turns out to be it's car number 10 out of 50 cars. So it's a type competition. So basically it was a 40 year anniversary from Isuzu, a homogulation. So basically the rally cross guys got together with the Isuzu people and, and came up with this car. So out of 50, 20 were naturally aspirated NAs and 30 were turboed, which is one of my cars. So it's one of 50 turbo cars. So you have oh, sorry, one of 30 turbo cars, yeah. So you now have two of 50 all time that have been made. In another country? Only one. That that one, this was not a numbered car. Just the, the type competition is a numbered car. So it had a little plaque and it's, it's stamped number 10. Everybody has the car that they want, top 10 cars that they've always wanted in their life. What's number one or two of the top? If you have a list of cars you've wanted someday, what would be your top two cars? Um, you know, I test drove a Camaro Supersport, like the last versions of the, like the swept back wing i don't remember what years these are in the 90s i think maybe early 2000s those are i, I test drove it and then six speed and just mm, beauty or an older maybe 87 88 irock something like that i, I mean i grew up around gm um and, and chrysler that's kind of the top yes my father bought it in 1948 the date for it was october 5th 1948 he bought this car he put it in registration under my mom's name, but he did, uh, drove it. But after a while, my grandfather said, this is too much of a car for you. I will buy it off of you. And he did. Well, the pr problem being is he only drove it a, a small amount on special times, and that was it. It sat in the garage a lot. And when I pulled this car out, of the garage it had less than 23,000 miles and he died in 81 S and I take this car like to parades or sh or you know shows or stuff like that and so right now I am just 13 miles short of 38,000 miles and this is a 1948 Hudson that's correct it, it's a Hudson Commodore which was their top of the line car yeah and the thing being is, I'm a person that will not restore the car. It's better to leave it original. This is what it came from the factory looking like. Just has age on it, because me and the car are the same age. And so we're, how'd you say, aging the same. Yeah. I don't know, I don't think you're cracking too much, but yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, and so I just leave it that way and I have people enjoy the car because a lot of people don't want you to be near their car. I have the doors open and they can sit in it. They can touch it. I one time had two older ladies come up and they were talking to me and reminiscing. So I said, well, why don't you just get in the back and sit down? They did. They were in there for an hour and a half. And people would come up and say to them, is this your car? And they go, 
Oh no, we're just sitting in it. <laughs> yeah. Talking about cars, I guess. Yeah, uh, that's such well, an interest. It brings back a lot of memories for them, uh -huh. you know. Different. Yeah. So, that's half the enjoyment of coming here, is for the people to enjoy the car and reminisce. You've got a lot of uh, other items as well. You brought along the. Um, Original sales receipt, I guess it is. What else? What else do you have? Oh well, I have receipts on, you know, the first service and how much it cost. Cost two dollars and eighty-eight cents. I, I, <laughs> I have in there the booklet. If you want to work on your car, it has all the specs. It has in that binder also on Hudson uniforms, Hudson on TV, just great amount of things that more than I can explain <laughs> wow. yeah you have a, a kind of a printing I, I, I it's want a die. it's a die is what it is it's a die that the Tacoma News Tribune would use to print out for the newspaper which was for the dealership where this car was bought yeah and that dealership closed how long ago that dealership closed in about 19 1950, around 1954, because that was the last year that Hudson was making an automobile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you said you went over there and wanted some of their stuff. You must have been pretty young at the time. I, I, was, I was pretty young. I was with my father, and I, 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 I wanted to make sure that we get all this stuff because it seemed important to me. Yeah. I got a feeling that you kind of knew even back then that this car was going to be in your life for a while. Yeah, yeah, because they, well, everybody knew that the car was coming to me after he passed away. So it did. And I've had, I've been in different parades with taking dignitaries, some unusual ones. Uh, well, one time I was down at the uh, waterfront, Tacoma waterfront. And they had a parade on the 4th of July. So I took this dignitary, I can't remember his name, but got to the end of the parade. And the official stopped me and told me, turn around, I want you to go back to the beginning. So I'm going alongside the parade, the opposite direction, turn the car around. The person I picked up was Miss America. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we have, you know, this the interior looks brand new, like you just worked on it recently. There's a tag on uh, the seat. Tag for the upholstery. In other words, from the manufacturer, still on the seats, stating the fact that basically they're brand new. Holy cow. Yeah. So everything you see inside this car is original. You were telling me about how even the headlights, while certainly are not original, except for maybe one of them? Right. One of them burned out time when we were down in Oregon, Seaside. That's the first time this car had ever been out of the Washington state. And it went out, so I had to stop off in an auto place and told them, I have a six-bolt system in that car. Do you have a headlight? They said, I think we still have one in the back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a great story. Yeah. That's a great story. So you have all sorts of interesting things back here. What's the best memory you have of this car? One of the best memories of this car was uh, my, well, it would be my son's wedding, and I chauffeured them in it. Uh, up to SeaTac, so they get uh, to the hotel there, and my son to their dances with their girl or boyfriend. Yeah, and I would pick them up because I used to wear a tuxedo with the white gloves, top hat, and the whole bit. And the one time I drove up and got in front of Olive Garden, got out, walked around, opened the door for them, they all went in. I got back in the car and I drove and I waited until they were about ready. I drove right up in front of the thing and I stood there at the door with my hands behind my back, 
waiting for them to come out. And all these people are looking at me like, what is going on? And they start walking out, and I opened the door, they got in, and then I took them to the high school for their dance. Immediately everybody there said, oh, do you rent out for weddings or anything like that? I've heard that, uh -huh. yeah. Wow, but that's very cool. Yeah. So what happens to the car? Have you already given, decided where the car is going when you, when, when you pay off? The only thing I want this car to go to is either to somebody who leaves it all original, has the same thoughts I do, or I would give it here to Tom LeMay's because I have talked to them before and they could have the car everything I got up there I don't need to get paid for it as long as that car goes to somewhere where it'll be enjoyed for being a car not just a showpiece in other words you can actually get in it sit down see what it's like and, stuff. and that'll wrap up the station wagon no it wasn't a Hudson station wagon edition of the talking about cars podcast right here on PowerTube TV. If you guys like today's show, don't forget, give us a thumbs up when we get on YouTube in a couple of weeks and follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, X, and even LinkedIn. Don't forget, you can watch any of our PowerTube TV episodes by checking out the video on demand online at watchpowertubetv.com or watchpttv.com or on the PowerTube app. Hot Rod Bob, yeah, he's on the poster. He will be back. In future episodes, I'm coming to you, of course, from the Pacific Northwest home of Two Tired Guys Productions right here in Washington State. I'm Randy Cardoon. We'll see you next time on the Talking About Cars podcast. Like this show? Want more? Then head to WatchPTTV.com, the new 100% free PowerTube TV streaming network. Home of the best classic and new motorsports racing and build shows on the web.